And um, let me get my clock up. And you may begin when you're ready. Oh, the TV went off. No, it's it's on. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Just making sure. Yeah. All right. Whenever you're ready. What is this class like? Good day, everyone, and welcome to my thesis, "The Future of Movement: An Inquiry into the Improvement of Parkour Competitions." Close to a year ago now, I decided to start practicing parkour, and it has already changed me in countless ways. I'm more passionate about movement than I have ever been about anything in my life, and I've fallen in love with the community and the feeling of personal progression in my training. I'm new to the world of parkour, but I'm utterly obsessed with this sport, this practice, this art, and I want to see it flourish, which is why I'm doing my thesis on how today's parkour competitions can be improved. Chances are all of you have heard the word parkour somewhere. The word carries a lot of association for some people. Many of you think of a scene from The Office. Others picture chase scenes from action movies. You might, uh, if you're a little more knowledgeable on the subject, you might think of men leaping between rooftops or doing flips off of walls. However, I think few of you know what parkour is really like for most people who practice it, and even less of you will know how the practice came to be. Today, I will begin by sharing some of parkour's history. Then I will delve into the current state of parkour competitions and how to improve them. When Mount Pelé erupted in 1902, it killed over 30,000 people on the Caribbean island of Martinique, becoming the third deadliest volcano in recorded history. At the time, a French naval lieutenant named Georges Hebert helped coordinate the evacuation of around 700 indigenous and European refugees. Watching people move in the aftermath of the eruption, he noticed that the indigenous citizens overcame obstacles in their path with dexterity and resourcefulness, while the European population moved slowly, not knowing what to do when familiar pathways no longer existed. He concluded that modern man had lost the ability to move efficiently in complex spaces and that to be of most value to society, a person must combine altruism and courage with athleticism. Hebert continued to travel the world and observe how indigenous cultures moved. Through his studies, he created a training regimen called the Natural Method. Before long, the Natural Method became the standard training system for the entire French military, evolving into the obstacle courses we see in firefighting and military training today, and eventually into parkour. In the 1940s and 50s, a Parisian firefighter by the name of Raymond Bell used the natural method to hone his physical abilities to legendary levels. He could scale the sides of buildings in seconds without a ladder, walk confidently on ledges several stories in the air, and most famously, he hung from a helicopter to reach the top of the Notre Dame Cathedral. Raymond Bell's son, David, and a group of his childhood friends learned this man's proto-parkour and started to practice it out in the streets of France. David Bell is considered by many to be the father of parkour. He and his friends called themselves the Yamakaze, and together they started to adapt Raymond's skills into a more adaptable form of movement, focusing on speed over obstacles. Members of the Yamakaze went on to develop many foundational skills which make the modern parkour method unique. The word parkour was adapted from the French word for course or route, and the people who practiced it called themselves tracures. Up until this point, parkour was not a sport. Traceurs and traceuses trained in order to develop discipline, learn to deal with fear, and above all, to improve themselves as people. Eventually, a few of the yamakaze became less interested in the altruistic and utilitarian ideals of parkour and to focus on expression and creative movement. One of these people is a man named Sebastian Foucan. You might recognize him from the opening scene of Casino Royale. And he coined the term free running as an English translation for parkour. Parkour is unlike most sports in many ways. Most importantly, there is no game time. Sports like hockey, fencing, sailing, and dressage might seem completely different from one another, but they all have a dual quality to them. A fencer and a sailor both practice for the actual sporting event. In most disciplines, competition is the place athletes prove their skills, and without it, a sport could no longer exist. But parkour is not the same way at all. In parkour, the jumps you do in practice are the sport. Every flip is the real thing, and with each move, you're testing yourself against your surroundings. Nobody needs to be around to see it. Today, 
There are many established parkour and free running competitions, and despite the fact that parkour does not revolve around performance in the same way other sports do, competition has found a place in the culture. Since the late 2000s, professional parkour competitions have been a growing in number and popularity, but parkour is definitely still a fringe activity with a culture <clears throat> resembling that of early skateboarding in many ways. There is no internationally recognized governing body to regulate free running competitions. Therefore, competitions have not been standardized, so different people run them different ways. I think it's important for me to clarify that I did not research this topic in order to discover the best form of competition. The purpose of my thesis is to posit solutions to some current issues and discover how competition organizers can improve their events. Today, there are three, com three competition formats in widespread use which work to roughly encompass the main types of training found in parkour. In a speed comp, athletes are given a route to complete as fast as they can, and the courses are designed to give them many ways to tackle each obstacle. The athletes are tested on their speed, strength, and strategic thinking, but the only measurement of success is time, making it the most objective form of competition. You can think of it like a 100 meter dash, but it's through obstacles and doesn't always go in a straight line. In a skill comp, the most recently introduced format, athletes are faced with a series of diverse, unique challenges that must be completed within a certain amount of time or number of attempts. Skill competitions test athletes on their technique, strength, adaptability, and focus. The most commonly seen format is the style competition. Athletes design a sequence of moves strung together into a line or a run these competitions test both an athlete's ability to choreograph movement and their skill in performing it. Competitors are usually evaluated by a team of judges on difficulty, execution, flow, and creativity, but the criteria often vary, vary based on the individual contest. A style comp is somewhat comparable to an artistic gymnastics event held in an obstacle-filled environment. Of the three formats, not only are they the most common, but style comps are also the most complicated and have no standard rule set yet. Therefore, I will be discussing them the most. There are several other forms of competition too, including online contests that gained popularity during the pandemic, but no other rule sets have come close to the popularity of the big three. There's hardly any academic literature on parkour competitions, and even if there were, I don't believe that a comp topic as subjective as this is best addressed by scholars. So for this project, I contacted and interviewed several prominent and experienced figures in the global movement community, most of whom are my personal heroes. And I asked them about their personal ideas in competition and about experiences in their parkour careers. With each interview, I gained a better grasp of both how many variables are involved in planning and creating a good competition and also discovered issues with the current systems. The following sections will appear as follows. Setting, safety, gender equality, youth in competition, judging movement, selecting officials, and growth of the sport. When designing a competition, the setting is an important thing to think about. The layout, materials, and conditions of a course can greatly affect the type of movement athletes will do there. For example, if you put a 10 foot tall platform in the middle of a style course, people are gonna do big flips off of it. And if you build bars over the, all over the place, athletes will do more moves involving swinging. Wooden obstacles will give contestants slightly more courage to try dangerous moves than concrete would. And staging a contest outside in an uncontrolled environment, as opposed to in a free running gym, can create all sorts of small differences. Dealing with the sun in your eyes and worrying about the damp grass and dusty walls of a street spot as an element of realism to competition, making it more closely resemble actual training. But several of the experts I spoke to pointed out that the very idea of competition is not at all part of the parkour ethos. Parkour is about testing yourself and growing as an individual, not about comparing yourself to others. Competition parkour and normal actual free running are different activities. And one of the purposes of many competitions is to push the sport to new horizons. If the goal is to expand athletes' capabilities, a competition should be in as controlled an environment as possible, like at the air whip challenge. So the only thing the competitor has to think about is the movement. If the goal of the competition is to be a media spectacle, the setting might be changed to something more scenic. 
like the Red Bull Art of Motion competition in Greece and Italy, or the Skylever course on Tianmen Mountain in China. Free running is a dangerous activity. But the thing that separates it from other dangerous sports like American football, surfing, or MMA is that most injuries we get are self-inflicted, like we jumped ourselves off that roof. So parkour athletes have the unique ability to pick and choose if they're going to do something that will get them hurt. The key to longevity in this sport is knowing what you shouldn't try. In competition, athletes are under pressure. They have a limited time to prepare, and then there comes a moment when they have to perform. Performance is not a skill for your runners practice a whole lot. In training, we do our line when we feel ready, and when we mess up, we can just retry until we get it. The pressures of having to do everything perfectly on cue in front of an excited crowd are a dangerous thing in competition. Athletes try moves that would, they would normally be too afraid to attempt, and they can injure themselves. Competition organizers don't want people getting hurt. So the first few comps around 2007 had mats and pads laid on the ground throughout the course. Having mats seems like a good way to avoid injuries, but what actually ended up happening was athletes went for tricks they weren't confident they could safely land and there ended up being more injuries. Does this mean there should be no safety precautions? I don't think so. Obstacles should obviously be tested for grip and stability and you don't want puddles or broken glass on a course but there's not a consensus in the community as to how safe competition should be made. Changing the course so that athletes don't hurt themselves on it is one way to address the safety issue, but we can approach safety from the other direction as well. If we take the stance that competitions should make efforts to keep athletes from hurting themselves, it would make sense to put restrictions on the types of moves they can do. For example, no triple flips. There are plenty of band tricks in gymnastics. The problem with this tack is that it isn't tailored, isn't tailored to individuals. People going into competitions all have specialties. A triple backflip for someone who specializes in big, fast flips might not be as dangerous as a double backflip for, by someone who specializes in twisting or creative movement. If someone has put in the time to get really good at a specific move and they can do it confidently and safety, safely, then the trick doesn't make any sense anymore. Another issue in today's competitions is the inclusion of women. If you think back to a time when you've seen a person doing parkour in person or on social media, was it a man you saw? Parkour is an extremely male dominated activity as it stands. And from what I've seen, many competitions perpetuate the lack of female representation. One thing I think almost certainly needs to be changed in parkour competitions is the ability for women to compete separately from men. In almost every sport, except some non-physical ones like croquet, competitors are separated by sex. But even today, there are competitions with both men and women fighting for the same prize. Because of the low number of female athletes, sometimes there may not be enough women to fill a bracket. But if a few brave women want to try their hand at a competition and we pit them against men in a sport this physical, they aren't likely to come back. For the sake of a diverse community, it's important that women's competitions be given equal priority. It shouldn't become a situation like soccer where there's a World Cup and then the Women's World Cup. There should just be two World Cups. The first scenario, the worst scenario I can think of though, would be for parkour competitions to become like the NFL. Have you ever noticed that there is no WNFL? That's because the NFL is, Ameri is the American Football League for both men and women. It's just that no woman has ever made it in. It's not just men and women who want to compete though. Most new practitioners are children and teens. And with them, things aren't so straightforward. In parkour, there's a huge emphasis on knowing your own capabilities. And some of the youth these days are easily skilled enough to compete with adults. Nevertheless, if we don't trust 15 year olds to vote for government represent, re representatives, how can we trust them to weigh the long-term risks of doing double backflips? I spoke with Seth Ruji a professional speed and skill athlete, founder of the Midwest Parkour League, and director of the competition committee of the US Parkour Association. He told me that one of the worst nightmares for a competition organizer would be for a child to die at a competition. And then not only would the person be dead, but then insurance companies would likely refuse to cover parkour competitions and they wouldn't be able to happen. It makes sense to me that there should be more safety regulations in youth comps than for adults. 
the athlete Kevin Franzen, who's been a teenager for his entire competition career, pointed out that any kids who feel comfortable doing double flips will have been training for years, maybe just as long as the adults. Most parkour comp practitioners would agree that nobody knows an experienced athlete's limits better than them. So say we treat young athletes like adults and trust them not to kill themselves. Should they be allowed to compete against adults if they're skilled enough to qualify? Competitions would certainly be more fair if, comp if competitors were separated by skill instead of just age. But parkour doesn't have any progression system like belt colors and martial arts. And given how diverse the styles in parkour are, it would be hard to make something like that work even if we wanted to. Another consideration in the debate of youth and competition is the obstacles athletes face. Youth comps are often held on the same course as the adults use, which means that we have 13 year old girls swinging off the same eight or nine foot tall bars as the fully grown men and taking heavy impact like that is not healthy for growing bones. Now we'll move on to my most complex topic, which is the issue of judging movement. The overarching theme I found in my conversations about this was the balance between objective detail oriented judging and subjective more general judging. The two extremes on this spectrum can be represented by gymnastics competitions and breakdancing battles. Before I get into that, though, I want to introduce a term of my own devising, style funneling. When you make a competition, any type of competition, you give competitors criteria that they will be judged on. And, it, it, and you give competitors criteria that they will be judged on. It will change the way they perform. Competitors must change their performance to fit the criteria or they will simply lose. That makes sense. But when every contestant starts to fit the criteria better, they will be less distinguishable from one another and judges will have to add new, more specific judging criteria to assess them on. It becomes a feedback loop. Gymnastics is a perfect example of a sport that has experienced style funneling. Gymnastics routines have almost no personal style in them. Yes, gymnasts are unparalleled acrobats, but they are all so similar to one another that judges have to tell them apart by how pointed their toes are. Breakdancing is almost the opposite. Dancers do impressive and crowd-pleasing routines, and then when they're done, the judges simply point to the one they think should win. That's it. No judging criteria, no tallying points, not even an explanation of their decision. Obviously, that's a pretty radical type of judging and might be too unofficial for something like the Olympics. I imagine there being a lot of hurt feelings in this system. On the other hand, though, there are two very good reasons why I think parkour shouldn't try to follow in the footsteps of gymnastics, at least not fully. First off, individuality, freedom, and personal expression are huge parts of free running culture, and to create a system as regimented as gymnastics would end that. Secondly, it would be really, really hard. The reason sports like gymnastics and figure skating can judge movement so consistently and precisely is that they have taken every trick in the sport and assigned it a point value. If someone does a back handspring or a triple axel, it's worth this many points. In free running, the format of the event is much the same. You're performing a short choreographed acrobatic routine, but you're not doing your routine on a flat surface or even a preset arena. The environment is different in every competition. That's a fundamental part of the game, which means that create, to create a gymnastics-like system for free running, a rule maker would need to assign a point value to a side flip done on flat ground, a side flip onto a two foot wide beam, a side flip onto a rail eight feet up in the air, a side flip off of a 12 foot tall platform onto grass, a side flip over a four foot three inch wall where they then stick the landing on a ledge five feet away, which is set at a 60 degree angle from the takeoff with a four foot ceiling above it so the athlete doesn't have to duck to avoid hitting their head, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, the obstacle combinations can be almost infinite. And then you have to realize that in parkour, new tricks are made up daily, and lots of them don't even have names. When I spoke to the German athlete, Matthias Meyer, he compared the style competition to a painting contest. How does a judge decide what's a better piece of art? They can either do it subjectively, just by picking the one they like most based on their personal aesthetic and taste, or they can assign criteria for the art to conform to, like the more realistic it is, the better, which would end up as a good artist as the winner, but someone like Picasso wouldn't stand a chance. 
so you can understand this next part better. I will show you some clips from a bunch of my favorite athletes to give you a picture of the diversity of movement in free running. Being able to do moves at height is a fundamental part of parkour for some people. This is terrifying. <laughs> For others, it's all about efficiency. This guy is my age. I interviewed this athlete. If we aren't going to judge competitions subjectively, then we really need to figure out what criteria to use and preferably do it in such a way that all free runners have a fair shot at winning. One of the things I really wanted to figure out from my interviews was whether the current style competitions were inclusive enough. The four most common criteria are difficulty, execution, flow, and creativity. Just looking at them objectively, I think they're quite general and can be used to describe a broad section of movement. But even though the rules don't mention any specific type of movement, style competitions are almost synonymous with flips. I didn't understand why that could be at all, but the athletes Bob Reese and Kalen Chan explained to me their belief that adding flips to lines is a natural extension of the difficulty criterion. If you have a gap, you can jump across it. And if you wanna make things harder, you can do a flip over the gap. If you want to make things even harder, you can just do a harder flip. I must say that although both of these athletes are my idols, I disagree with them on this. People can do just as difficult runs without doing flips. In fact, there have been two instances, to my knowledge, where athletes performed lines without flips at an international competition. In both cases, they made it to the finals. So are style competitions actually geared towards living athletes? I'm making the case that no, they aren't. And I think the overrepresentation of flipping in style comps can be attributed to a few things. Flips are fun to train and impressive to watch. I can't think of any high level parkour athlete who can't do flips. Because they are so fun and cool, more people practice them. So the flipping athletes already outweigh the athletes who don't focus on flips. On top of that, athletes who don't like to do flips are less likely to want to compete anyway. Those people are typically more geared toward traditional parkour training and values and reject competition for being against those values. Also, everyone is doing flips in competition. It has become accepted that that is the way to win. So the cycle continues. I think that highly skilled movers who don't flip as much do in fact have a chance at winning style comps, but they're extremely outnumbered and many of them don't even try. On to another topic. In a sport so young, how do you choose officials? Little to no programs exist for training and certifying competition organizers, course designers, or judges. On top of that, a good portion of the really capable judges are still wanting to compete. To put the age of the sport into perspective, David Bell and Sebastian Fukon, two of the very first people to start training, are 47 and 46 years old, respectively. There is no population of old retired athletes at this stage. And even if there were, some of the moves the kids are doing these days were unheard of 10 years ago. Okay, you might ask, but do you really need to be good at flips to be a good judge? And are the best athletes necessarily the best judges? Those are smart questions. If you allow me to contrast parkour with gymnastics one last time, we'll see that many of their judges are retired athletes. That totally works with gymnastics because the sport has not changed all that much since the judges were training. And more importantly, gymnastics has a concrete scoring system that lets judges plug in the values of each trick and subtract points for execution. Theoretically, a non-gymnast who knows the names of each move and how much they're worth could fill out a gymnastics judging sheet just as well as a gymnast. In parkour, this is not the case because a judge must be able to tell how hard a move is or how creative it was. And I could go on a whole tangent about how creativity makes no sense of the judging criterion, but I'll save that for another time. So 
The point is that the way things are set up currently, a judge has to know a lot about movement to judge well. The rapid increase of difficulty and creativity in parkour could slow eventually, but for now, the only way to have good judges is to find active top tier athletes who are not interested in competing or find a way to create judges through specialized instruction. Free running is an entertaining sport, so you might be surprised to know that very few athletes actually make a living from parkour. By far the biggest prize in any competition was a $10,000 reward to, to the winner of the fight or flight online tournament last summer. For any free runner, that is a lot of money. But when you compare that amount to how much athletes earn in other sports, it's laughably small. Lionel Messi earns an average of more than $3 million per game. The boxer Canelo Alvarez makes about $35 million every fight. Why don't parkour athletes make more money? The fact is that there's really very little money circulating in the sport. The deeper cause is a fundamental difference between parkour and almost every other sport in existence. Parkour does not require any equipment, special facilities, or uniforms. None. If they felt inclined, a person could go practice parkour butt naked in the Siberian tundra. Since no tracers are buying rackets or wheels or skis or harnesses or balls or jerseys or golf clubs, the only business that the few existing parkour brands have is in shoes, clothes, and on occasion, training equipment and gym memberships. For money, some free runners are able to find sponsorships with non-parkour drink and clothing companies. However, the ideal, of course, would be for parkour brands to be wealthy enough to support athletes. All this talk of the economy is not just essential to competition so that individual athletes can make a living. It can affect their movement as well. Lack of money can make it hard for athletes to commit to participating in something like a competition. The prize for winning is rarely very big in comparison to the cost of living and travel, which means that even for the select athletes that qualify and win, if they travel to get there, they're probably just about breaking even. Cash prizes can be a powerful incentive, not only for athletes to enter contests, but to push themselves as well. In the fight or flight competition, the video submissions included some of the hardest lines done in competition history. If we want to start a booming economy around parkour, the obvious course of action is to follow the pre-existing models of other sports. Parkour would want to solidify its judging criteria in a way that allows for definitive winners. Ideally, there would be a hugely publicized world championships, merchandise, and maybe even ways to set official parkour world records as there are a lot of moves that are unique to the sport. If parkour com competitions become popular for the public to watch, companies would be more likely to invest money into the sport. Parkour athletes and brands will be able to make more money, which will allow athletes to train more, and brands will be able to support athlete more athletes financially. Another benefit of publicizing competitions is that ca they can attract new practitioners, which is certainly a positive. Looking back at my hours of interviews and research, I, try, I, I tried to finally answer the question, how, par, how can parkour as individuals and as a community improve their competitions? I came up with two solutions, which ideally go hand in hand. The first is smaller scale. The most important thing to do as a competition organizer is to sit down and figure out why you're having this event. Is it to crown a champion, to make money or boost the parkour economy, to attract outsiders into the sport? Is your competition an entertainment spectacle where the goal is to do the most awesome moves and impress an audience, or is it simply a fun community event? Any of all and all of these are perfectly fine motives. And when you consciously realize what your goals are, problems like deciding on a setting or judging system or course design start to solve themselves. Parkour is a process of an individual learning about their capabilities and spending time testing themselves and growing better. My vision for how parkour competitions can be improved will take the same process. We need to experiment with new systems, new rules, learn what works and what doesn't, continue innovating, and never stop improving. You might be wondering why this presentation is titled The Future of Movement when it's just about parkour. Seems a bit dramatic, right? Well, I think that free running is more than just a sport. It's something truly unique. In parkour, we take things from other sports. 
We use techniques from invented by rock climbers and break dancers, skiers, gymnasts, and others, but we combine them together and do things that are distinctive to parkour. The idea, the activity doesn't have a single accepted definition, but the reason why I say the future of parkour is the future of movement is because to me, parkour is pure freedom of movement. It's the process of learning how to move and parkour truly is the pinnacle of movement. I have faith in free running's potential. So someday I wouldn't be very surprised if it is the most popular sport in the world. Thank you for coming to my thesis. What are you still curious about? Please. Um, you talked a little bit about kind of youth safety and uh, youth introduction into parkour. Um, and I was curious how, uh, kind of as a society, we can help like kind of support that. Would it be schools? Would it be independent clubs? What's the best way to get more youth into this sport? I think it would be awesome if like PE teachers included parkour into their curriculums, but just with people who aren't teachers can in, can enroll their kids in parkour classes, which is going to be fun for the kids, but also will help athletes who uh, are, are coaches make a living. So I think that's how I answer. Yeah. Do you think parkour is in need of a certain type of rebranding in order to make it sort of more palatable? Because I mean, everybody's first image is that big jump that guy did, right? And like, you know. <laughs> Hell, if I'm going to sign my kid up for that, yeah. but how can you make it more palatable to teach it? Like, you know, focus. It's more about moving naturally because I think all, you know, a lot of like the survival thing. A lot of parents would be interested in that, but you know, you speak parkour, and I'm thinking, you know, Ukrainians jumping building to building and run down, <laughs> yeah. right? So everybody. Thinks. So, do you think that's something that needs to be addressed or should be addressed? Have you thought about that at all? Definitely. I, I really, I, I enjoy talking to people about it and like um, giving them a different idea or vision for what parkour is. But I think, and, and so I think that's helpful, but the best way I think to do it is just word of mouth and more athletes or more people joining into the sport and talking to other people about it and getting them to do it. And because different people have different ideas of what parkour is. So, uh, some people it's pure, like pure expression and freedom of movement some people it's like okay if i'm being chased i want to be able to move through this area as fast as possible and, and for some people it's literally just exercise so yeah it, it varies and i think the more people that are in it the more the whole community will start to get an idea of what it is but no one there's no definitive definition of it yet Mr. Question from online. Uh, Andrew Dugas asks, asks, what were you most surprised to discover when researching your thesis? I was kind of surprised to find out that Bob Reese and Kaylin Chan thought that uh, style competitions should, should be for flipping athletes because those, those are my favorite guys. Like I've, my family sits down on, on Thursdays I'm like the Bob Reese video is out on YouTube and we go watch it. And so he, I was like, do you think that uh, uh, style competitions are inclusive enough? And he was like, actually, I don't think they should be inclusive. I think they're meant for flipping athletes. And so that was surprising to me. You had one, Jillian? I did. Um, so you talk a lot about, you know, trying to get parkour to be more inclusive and have more representation and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I think a lot of people, Specifically, girls. I know. I know um, a girl who makes a lot of documentaries about being a girl who is a free runner and her experience as a woman in the sport. Um, What's her and name? What? What's her name? Uh, Sen. I totally know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. And you know, like she talks a lot about how the hardest thing is for people to get started. So, what would you say is, you know, if you, if like, let's say, if I'm interested in parkour, like, I would have no idea what my first step should be. So, what, yeah. what's your advice on that? Well, there are parkour gyms in a lot of cities with coaches who like it's kind of their job to introduce people to parkour. Um, and also this presentation was a view of 
one type of FAR 4. I didn't really talk about the training, which is what it is really for most people. Uh, and most people don't compete. Mm -hmm. So really, you can go to a gym and, and try and take classes and learn things from people, or you can do what I did because I started like right at the beginning of the pandemic where I just go out to a park and jump around and I watch a lot of videos of other people moving and get inspired by that and try new things. So yeah, try new things. <laughs> <laughs> So you, throughout your presentation, you made the comparison of car horse and gymnastics a lot, and you also mentioned that gymnastics, in terms of competition, was very heavily regulated, where each move corresponds with one point. So when it comes to par four competitions, and I feel like as the sport ages and as it becomes more public, it will become more, the competitions will become more regulated. So how do you think that those regulations and those judging criteria will impact the creativity and the uniqueness of parkour as a sport? And how do you think that parkour will be able to retain its uniqueness with all those hypothetical judging criteria? Okay, so I think that if you, as I said, if you put criteria on the movement, it will just start to funnel into the same thing uh, with all athletes doing the same type of movement. And I don't know that there's a way to avoid that, but you don't have to have competitions uh, with judging criteria like that. And I, and I think the best way to retain our uniqueness is to, for people to like, they have an idea for a competition and try it out. Like something that, like I, I personally have ideas for competitions that I would love to uh, make happen. And one of them is, I just, it's, it's similar to the breakdancing battle where I just pick like 20 professional athletes who are all very diverse in the type of movement that they do. And just tell them to tell the practitioners to do something, do a, a line that they find beautiful and tell the judges to pick a line that they find beautiful. And I think that could work as well too, but we just have to see what people like and people like gymnastics. Yeah. It's super popular. So I, I'm sort of afraid that free running could, will turn into gymnastics because free runners are like, yeah, I really like just doing, I really like getting good at hard flips. And there's so many athletes who just train triple twisting back flips all day and love it. But yeah. Okay. A question from the overflow room from Jamie. He asks, uh, how do you think we could keep parkour competition compositions safe, but also enjoyable for viewers? So I think he's referring to several of the pictures as people really close in and wondering how safe it is for viewers. The Well, the pictures of people crowding together were definitely like the audience and they weren't going to be where the athlete was going to be, if that's what you're talking about. But how do you keep competitions safe i think the the biggest emphasis needs to be on athletes keeping themselves safe just like in all of parkour and you can have i, I know there there are some competitions that have like thin like hard pads on the ground because if an athlete does mess up and like hits their head on the ground it, it's not like a, a hard pad isn't going to affect they're landing that much, but if they hit their head on the ground, it could affect like whether they die or not. So uh, it, I think it's all up to organizers and what they want. Okay. So every competition can be different and that there isn't a problem with that. Okay. So for you personally, are, are you hoping to keep doing parkour and someday maybe even compete? Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be doing parkour when I'm 80, for sure. Uh, and I think competitions for me would be really useful as a way to kind of hold a candle to my skills and figure out, okay, how good am I actually like a test in a class, like I think I know the material, but I don't actually know if I know it until I take a test. Competition is sort of the same thing. And so I would enjoy that, but I would not I don't know if I would want to actually 
actually, no, if I was good enough, I would totally compete at the high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But diving on the math, like, I have friends who have done this and that, and pretty universally, it seems like more or less you hit 30 and you stop doing it. Like, it's mm -hmm. really hard on the joints and this yeah. and that. Is that pretty accurate? Uh, is there anything that can be done to mitigate that? Because it's, it's, I've heard a lot from a yes. lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, this summer when I was training, I was not really paying attention to technique so much. I was just like trying to see mm -hmm. what I could do, like the biggest jump I could do or something like that. And my knees started hurting at the end of the summer and they, I'm still dealing with that. And so really taking care of your body is so important and warming up and stretching mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff, which is really hard to do and taking rest days is extremely hard for me yeah, to do, yeah. especially when I have two little brothers who never get hurt or tired, and so they can go, they can go train every day for forever. Um, but taking care of your body and and parkour doesn't have to be big stuff like that. So when I'm 80, I probably won't be doing roof gaps, but I <laughs> but I might be doing more like flowy, like yeah. on the ground and cool. stuff like that. Riley? Do you think that parkour could ever like split into two sections, like the one that's more like gymnastics, but the point system, and then one that's more about like creativity? Like, do you think that that would work, or would that like ruin kind of the beauty of it? I think that the the point system, like turning it into just a numbers game where you're you make a line with points in mind instead of uh, like the beauty of the, of the movement that would ruin it. But they're like speed competitions and skill competitions and style competitions are quite different from one another. So, and there are other types of competitions. So it's fine having different formats, but at least my vision for parkour is not in line with uh, gymnastics type system. Did I have one more question. Um, so you said you talked to a lot of your heroes and um, people you've watched on YouTube and watched in competitions. Were they receptive to your questions? Were they easy to get a hold of? Were they interested in giving you their honest opinions and interested in what you were doing with this thesis? Yeah, I I, I told all of them about this thing, so I'm I'm kind of I'm not sure if someone is one of them is listening but uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't be sure I, yeah. I have uh, one oh. person that might possibly be yes but I'm not sure probably not but anyways I I messaged about like almost 40 athletes from like 30, 20 30 different countries and only 10 or so got back to me and all of most of them like all except two said that they would love to talk and share their ideas they thought it was interesting and the two that couldn't one of them said i don't do competition so i don't know how it'd help you really but then he went on a like a texting <laughs> rant uh on why he doesn't do competitions and that was super helpful his english was super bad uh it, that, that was awesome and then there were couple athletes that were that said my, my English isn't very good but you could send me the questions and then they never got around to answering them mm -hmm. yeah whatever and then uh, the athletes I talked to were all all seemed super interested and like I was asking good questions that they hadn't thought about before and they were super fun there's like hour-long interviews I had an hour and 45 minute interview with this one German guy and it was but most most athletes, most athletes, I just they didn't see my message. I was contacting people on Instagram, and some of the athletes are like 1.4 million followers, and they get so many messages a day that they never see me. So, yeah, Reese, and yeah. Um, in your mind, what would a higher budget parkour look like? Uh, in a lot of the slides, it's kind of like these guys running around like these public areas or even a few gyms. Um, but what would more funding towards the sport actually translate to? 
well, bigger prize prizes for athletes. And I, I think it would just, it would mainly mean more athletes and like more really good athletes who have sponsors so that they don't have to have like a day job. Uh, so the whole standard of movement could be raised by having more better athletes and more more competitions would probably end up happening in cooler places with like a lot of the comp of the outdoor competitions are building their own structures so you could have huge courses maybe like i don't know if you saw the skyladder one was like a quarter mile long it was this huge staircase like super steep staircase and just parkour obstacles all the way down it uh and the, the more money they have, the, the cooler courses they can make. And probably the more like publicizing they might be on TV and stuff like that. And Jillian? In that kind of vein of those more highly expensive parkour now, I don't know a lot about parkour, so forgive me if this already exists, but I know there are some teams, but maybe if it gets more, um, if it's there's more funding involved, then do you see it ever becoming um, not maybe quite as structured as like NFL teams, but like dance companies kind of thing, um, where you join a team and they pay you a regular wage so you can train together and that kind of stuff. Or do you think it's more of an individual sport and that wouldn't really happen? There totally are parkour teams. And most of them are, I think, just to train together and, and some of them have merchandise and stuff. But the only um, place I, I right now that has teams competing against each other is this TV show called World Chase Tag. I don't know if any of you have seen it. And that, like, in the beginning, it was just groups of athletes getting together to be a part of World Chase Tag. It's just tag, and it turns out the best people at this tag game over obstacles were parkour athletes, as you know. Uh, so there was a recent new season of it in America during the during the pandemic. And it was all parkour, like actual parkour teams that were already together joined the competition. And it was, uh, there are a lot of people into it, like parkour athletes were posting all the World Chase Tag stuff. So stuff like World Chase Tag, the, the founders are not associated with parkour in any way. And they, in the beginning, they were like, we don't, they weren't intending it to be for parkour athletes. That just sort of happened. So I don't know if it really counts as a parkour competition, but that is totally a, a, a really fun team competition thing and it works. I was thinking, I don't know how much time I have, but I could go back and play the video. There was a that problem, your, I just accidentally skipped it. Yeah, your your father is asking to show the video. I, I, I will let you know your time right now is at 47 minutes, so. You you can weigh that. <laughs> Does the question just go into my? It's it's usually forty five. So, you, if you want if you want to make that call, I think people would probably like to see it. So, okay. All right. show it. yeah, show it. Yeah, I'll show it. Just I'm gonna go ahead and stop the clock. <laughs> I will stop the clock. <laughs> my, my grade yeah. is up to you. I'll be honest. I've already put your grade. So like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead and show it. I'll, I'll just let you watch and I'll tell you guys the people I interviewed. It looks like it's not gonna, it looks like it's not gonna make it. It does. Work. I was like, he's not gonna show us a fail. It's just his pose on there. Yeah. yeah. It, he, that's on purpose. Like yeah. a monkey. Yeah. This guy is the, the king of descent. So it was an efficient movement. Crazy 18 year old. <laughs> so, so this guy's all, this guy's also 18 or 19. I interviewed this guy. He lives in the U.S. So crazy. I interviewed this guy, this first man. He lives in Cincinnati, I believe. And then I'm gonna talk about smooth movers. This this Russian guy is the king of smoothness. I showed two clips by him. This guy is 19, I believe. This is the winner of the 
2019 Red Bull Art of Motion, which is the, the most recent biggest style competition in the world. This is that, that Russian guy again. There are like break dance moves. Yeah. yeah. And then I, people who just love to do big moves. Uh -huh. Oh, oh, oh my God. That's crazy. Ouch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like your ankles. Yeah. Oh. Wait, I'm just going to In the same oh. way, man. Yeah. I wonder how many of these people work as, like, some actors. Some of them. <laughs> this, is, this is Bob Reese. I about him. I interviewed this guy. He's 19. I interviewed this guy. He Did all these guys pretty much start as gymnasts? Some of them, but not all of them. I wanted to interview this person, but I couldn't get hold of him. Mm. And then I say that most movement doesn't, it's hard to fit into boxes though. Oh, no. I interviewed this man, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Precision to the underwater wall, that's so cool. Oh. <laughs> 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 Congratulations, Egon. That was fantastic. Great. Go ahead. I'll break my wrist.